Thank you, Zimbabwe, for tuning in to yet another informative edition of your program. This is Agricultural New Directions Agribusiness, where we discuss everything agribusiness in Zimbabwe. We are talking of business finance, production economics, time value of money, and the application of principles of money uh, in our agricultural fraternity here in Zimbabwe. I would like to notify our audience uh, for the sake of the, for those who are watching, please ignore my background. We have papers on the other side, and we also have cabbages on the other side. Can you please ignore that? Today, we want to focus on Chile's production. Action. And this is a demo plot. This is where the varieties are perfected to your perfect uh, genetics that you require in your fields for production and productivity's sake. At this point in time, I have taken the liberty of inviting Francis Mapindani. He is a vegetables expert. He's going to be taking us through the nitty gritties of producing chilies here in Zimbabwe. Francis, thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Waza, for having me here. It's a pleasure to be on your program, and I'm really, really happy to be talking about what I really love chilies. I'm a big fan of chilies and um, I love explaining everything about it. So yeah, uh, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much, Francis. As we get into our discussion, Francis, I understand that if you see the rows that we are standing in between, yes. we have another variety there. You can see that the chilies are slightly smaller. Then here we have giant pieces of chilies. Can you maybe highlight a brief background? What are these in the variety names? Okay, most of the chilies in Zimbabwe which are grown, um, they come in a bit of uh, a number of categories. Some of them are targeted for the local markets and some of them are targeted for the export markets. The local market is a bit bigger when it comes to a chili type that is a bit small, it's really tiny. It's called the African bird's eye type. That's the African bird's eye chili. It's quite consumed in much uh, as a dried chili and a lot of companies, processing companies, they usually grow that chili to put it in most of their chili sauces. Uh, we're looking at a number of things as well that they are going to play around with. So we definitely know that they are going to come through and go, uh, get to buy your crop. Then comes through the second um, section, mm -hmm. which are the Thai bed's eye type. They are bed's eye type also, quite hot, eh? And uh, we're looking at um, an aggression which can get up to around uh, 60,000 Scoville heat units which is high. I don't know if you know much about numbers, but I think you can hear that the number is quite high. Eh? <laughs> I could listen to that. Exactly. Yes. So it's quite hot and um, uh, it's a quite hot uh, variety. And we have two varieties under that category that you can get locally in Zimbabwe. There's Demon, which is quite popular with a lot of our farmers. And um, uh, also a variety called Red Thunder as well and Bandai. They are all varieties which are quite popular here in Zimbabwe, mostly targeted for the farmers who want to go to export most of their crops, export them to the EU, export them uh, probably to Asia as well and China as well they sometimes buy some of those chilies locally and South Africa South Africa gets them fresh and they get them dried as well okay. but if you're looking at the markets in the European Union uh, most of the ones that we're going to send they are going to be fresh okay. so you have to make sure that everything is organized when it comes to uh, your issue of uh, when it comes to your issue of uh, uh, sorting out your logistics quite so, so much better then lastly the bigger one that you mentioned yes. this variety it's called uh, serenade. It's okay. a type of chili called the serrano type. The serrano type is a bit much more bigger, but yeah, being bigger, yeah, it's, it's less aggressive though as compared oh, to the smaller okay. boys. Okay. The smaller boys are quite aggressive, but this one comes through in the 30s to the 40,000 uh, Scoville heat units. So it's slightly lesser. It's actually uh, not slightly, it's actually much, much more lesser uh, when it comes to uh, the aggression as compared to the other types that I mentioned, which are the um, Thai beds I type the African bears I type, uh, which are the two varieties that I mentioned. Francis, moving right along, I would like to talk about the conducive environment that is required to produce chilies. In Zimbabwe, we, we, we seem to have uh, quite a bit of a quite diverse uh, climate, which is quite good either way for both production of uh, the chilies in the high veld and also in the low veld. But in the high veld, we get a little bit of a restriction, especially during the winter season. Chilies are a warm uh, weather loving crop. Mm -hmm. They are very uh, frost prone. They don't like to be grown in frost prone areas and they are very frost sensitive. So it will be necessary if you know that your place is frosty, your field is going to be uh, in a place which is frosty or it has a history of having frosty conditions. You definitely, definitely need to make sure that you grow them during the warmer periods of the month of the year. So we'll be looking at the periods that range from August uh, up to probably um, a, a last planting window that can get close to around end of November. 
because you want to grow your crop and harvest it quite much before you get into uh, a time period where uh, your, your crop is going to be harvested during the, the, the winter period because during the winter period you get a lot of problems that you're going to get. There is less of uh, pollination which oh, happens. Okay. There is less bee activity during the colder seasons. So definitely you're not going to have um, as much uh, well pollinated chilies. You get a chili pod uh, which might be good from the exterior but the interior, you won't find any seed in that because oh. there's no pollination which would have happened on that. So okay. you definitely need to make sure that you try to make sure that most of the flowering and most of the fruiting happens during the time of the year when it's still quite much, much more warmer. And uh, in the low veld, the low veld, I think it's uh, those people are blessed. Chirezi, uh, we're looking at Mzarabani. Those are really, really good areas to grow your chilies because you can grow them all year long because oh, okay. they don't have any frost conditions that side. So you definitely know that you can go all year without any challenge that your crop is going to get uh, hit by frost. So it's something that our farmers have to look at. But in the high veld where we are today, we have to make sure that by end of November, we have done our last plantings so that we can make sure that uh, our harvest can start in March. Uh, maybe they can encroach probably into the May uh, period, uh, but uh, let's just try, uh, try not to make uh, the crop to get into the frosty uh, periods of the year um, uh, when they are still flowering. Are there any citations or any differences that you'd want to highlight between a farmer who's producing their chilies in a greenhouse setup and that one that is doing open field? Well, especially in the frost prone areas, it's something that can be entertained. But the one thing that we now have to look at is the economic output that yes. the crop is going to give within a confined area, probably like a greenhouse. Is the yield going to be enough for you to actually get to recognize a bit of a better economic return from your greenhouse? Or you would rather just go with another crop, uh, probably the tomatoes, something that can be harvested for longer and probably will give you higher yields. So it's possible it's really possible to actually grow them under those conditions, especially when you have demand for those. But I would feel maybe it can happen on a larger scale. But especially on the type of greenhouse that we have here in Zimbabwe, where we have a lot of the 400 meter to 800 yes. square meter kind of greenhouses, I don't feel like it makes economic sense to grow them in there. But it's possible. It's okay. something which our farmers can actually try to Thank you on. so much, Francis. There you had it, viewers. We are talking of chilies production here in Zimbabwe. We are standing at a demonstration plot where our trials are perfected so that farmers purchase their seed that is up to good notch so that they remain viable in their enterprises. We are going to go on a short commercial break. We'll be right back with this and more in the second segment. Stay tuned. <laughs> Today we are looking at chilies production here in Zimbabwe and we are standing on a demonstration plot where they have selected their varieties to ensure that our Zimbabwe's uh, farmers are educated and they have enough knowledge to undertake chilies production as a business. Now viewers, we encourage you to be a part of these conversations. Feel free to get in touch with you, the producer was Anay Manure. It's on 077-2807-506. Alternatively, you can like our Facebook page, Agribusiness with Wazanai. Leave your comments and suggestions and make a follow-up and more on this episode where we are talking of Chili's production on our YouTube channel is Agribusiness with Wazan I. We are also now available on Twitter where most of these discussions take place is at Agribusiness 110. Francis, we are here in the second segment. Welcome back. Thank you so much, Father. Yes. As we get deeper into our discussion, Francis, I want us to talk about pests and diseases that are a nuisance when it comes to producing chilies. I'm eager to know pests that chew on uh, the chilies, given that we have a very bitter, aggressive variety. Can you maybe talk to us uh, about that? Thank you so much for that question. So I'll start off with the pests, the major pests that are going to affect our, our chili crops. Um, I think we can start off with the background of the family that the chilies are, are, are housed under. That's the Solanaceae family. In layman terms, that's the same family that houses the tomatoes, the tobacco, we're looking at eggplants as well. That's the same family and peppers as well. That's literally the same family. So anything that affects our chilies also affects our tomatoes and anything that affects our tomatoes and tobacco probably will, uh, most highly, highly likely it will affect our chili crop. So okay. we'll start off with the, with, the, with the soil paste where we can see definitely that nematodes are, doing, are going to be a problem, especially if you are not going to rotate your, uh, your, your soils quite well. Uh, especially the places where probably we've grown, uh, we've grown our tobacco crop before or probably we've done our tomato crop before. If the previous crop had a problem with nematodes, definitely we know that our chilies are going to be affected. Okay. And it will affect your crops. You still trust to see your crops starting to wilt on their own as the um, as the gauze that most of the most of those uh, nematodes form on the roots 
end up blocking water movements within our plant which ends up causing wilting on the top leaves of your plant so it's something that our farmers have to really look out for and each and every time i would actually feel it would be nice for our farmers to be a bit much more preventative when it comes to growing their chilies make sure that you just drench soon after transplanting uh, with uh, popular nematicides that are on the market that a lot of uh, chemical suppliers have most of them uh, they have a lot of uh, solutions that they can co effectively cover nematodes so our farmers can uh, our viewers can just check with their favorite chemical car supplier for the best solution for nematodes then uh, as we move on we'll get cutworms being a problem yes. soon after transplanting we definitely know that we're going to have a problem with uh, uh, with cutworms especially if we use manure or a proper uh, probably any other place which is quite prominent with those cutworms and white grubs as well those ones we can make sure that we drench with uh, larvicides that are available which might include some generic chemicals like lambda which are all uh, which are available on the market which a lot of chemical suppliers uh, deal with and we're looking at fenvelarate as well our farmers can maybe play with that soon after planting make sure just to drench with your fin it and you'll be okay and as we go onwards we see white flies white flies are a bit of a challenge as well especially in areas prone with white flies probably where you're going to do your tomatoes you're going to have white flies you definitely need to deal with your white flies there are a lot of um, generic chemicals on the market like imidacloprid acetamiprid our farmers should just make sure they keep those little things at bay because they help in terms of transmitting some diseases eh? uh, especially viral diseases mm -hmm. we need to make sure that we don't have any even the tobacco mosaic virus or probably some pepper mosaic viruses as well that can come through and actually affect our pepper thrips uh, those um, uh, those uh, white flies can be a bit of a challenge so we need to make sure that we control them then lastly the one other uh, important pest when it comes to chilies is the false codling moth oh okay. it's a little worm um, it's the lava of the false codling moth which is a bit of a challenge for us this is the little thing that you mentioned i still remember you still uh, mentioning one thing about chilies being hot and yes, uh, and, having a pest. and all exactly <laughs> you this little pest seems quite tolerant to that it can bore into your chili fruit as hot as it is i'm talking about demon having a having a heat unit of sixty thousand, and this thing can still bore into that and um it's it's something which is a a, a, a nuisance hey especially when you're targeting to export your crop because as soon as they see that uh, that uh, little worm in your fruits when they receive their crop probably in the uk or probably in the, um, uh, uh, anywhere in the eu you definitely know that they are going to confiscate your crop and burn it and oh, you're not going to okay. get any return from that so our farmers have to be really really um aggressive when it comes to controlling the, this little pest and it also comes through with a problem where it bores into your fruit and the um sort of like entrance where it entered the fruit uh, through it's going to leave a wound and the wound can be uh, probably uh, an inlet for any secondary infection that can affect your fruit. So probably it might bore into your fruit, then you start to see your fruit starting to rot. Okay. Exactly. Once that starts to happen, you know that your crop is damaged and you need to make sure that you control that. So the false codling moth can be controlled by a lot of uh, um, generic um, um, uh, pesticides that include probably emamectin benzoate we're looking at anything that probably has indoxacarb in it there are some chemicals that are, can be used to control this false codling moth so our farmers should always make sure that they're on top of that then on the diseases i think i'll just mention the fusarium wilts which affect our young plants when they're still young they cause the uh, roots to start to rot and uh, clog up our plant veins and cause our plant to wilt then we'll look at dumping off as well which affects young seedlings our farmers should just make sure that they come through with a a fungicide drench probably even of copper oxychloride soon after planting it will actually help with that then uh, uh the next best uh the next important one is uh powdery mildew mm -hmm. powdery mildew causes your uh, flowers to start to drop you start to see on your, uh, your leaves you start to see uh your leaves starting to drop on their own and they have a characteristics where the leaves look ashy like they have a powder rubbed on it you mean to make sure that you manage to control that so bring through your uh fungicides make sure that you have a routine fungicide program that brings about close to three fungicides that you can rotate probably on a weekly or even uh, a bi-weekly basis uh, co comparing uh, with, the, with the level of infestation that you have in your field. Okay now Francis before we close this segment I would like us to talk about periods up to maturity. How many days are we looking at up to maturity and we will beginning from uh, transplanting or maybe seeding starting with the seedlings your nursery. Can you talk about days up to maturity? What are we looking at? From um, days to maturity, we might talk about the nursery. The nursery usually is about close to six weeks 
from seeding up until the time to, for you to start to transplant your crop. You need to make sure that you manage to control that. Uh, so it's something that our farmers need to look at. Six weeks and um, pretty sure within six weeks our crops should be in a place where they can be transplanted. Then we'll also look at um, the time from transplanting to the first harvest. That's close to between 80 to 90 days with most of the varieties that we have. We're looking at uh, flowering probably starting at day 45. And uh, our chili start off as green, eh? Start off as green and we need to make sure that we leave them to turn. So we can, uh, from the time that they become green, and uh, uh, from the time that we start to see them green, we need to wait up until they become red. Oh, then we can okay. start to sell them off as red. Thank you so much, Francis. That was very detailed. And now that we're gonna go on a short commercial break. We'll be right back with this and more in the third and final segment. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back viewers, you are watching Agriculture on New Directions Agribusiness where we equip each other with the knowledge and business finance on how to undertake your enterprises as a business person in agriculture. Today we are looking at chilies production from a trials or demonstration perspective. We are looking at standing here at a demonstration plot where they have established two varieties to ensure that our farmers are equipped with the knowledge and to showcase to those farmers who want to purchase these seedlings or these seeds or these varieties. Francis, we are here in the third and final segment. Welcome back. Thank you so much, Father. Uh, Francis, earlier on we spoke of days to maturity. Now I want to divert your attention a bit and talk about nutrition. What are we looking when it comes to basal fertilizer, top dressing, or even uh, compost or manure? What are we looking at when it comes to nutrition? Thank you so much, Waza, for that question. The first thing that I usually recommend our farmers when they are starting to grow their chili crop is to come through and test their soils first. I'm very sure you're familiar with that. Yes. Get our soils tested so that we get to know the right nutrition, get to correct the, the, the nutritional status of the soil. We get to know what kind of salts are we lacking or which salts will we have within our soil. And we get to know each and every nutrient in clear detail. And wherever possible, if the pH is low, we get to correct it by making sure that we bring the right uh, um, uh, lime that we can use for our crop could be dolomitic for if our soil is lacking more on the magnesium side we can be bringing our calcitic if calcium is lacking because if we look at our chili crop it's quite demanding when it comes to calcium um, especially the fruits we need to make sure that the fruits are good quality the skin is uh, uh, the calcium improves the elasticity of oh, our okay. of our crop skin we need to make sure that we make sure that our our fruit skin is going to be quite stronger we reduce any challenge of having our crop to have stretch marks on them um, oh, okay. yeah they can have some marks on them which uh, can result from uh, from uh, cracking so it's something that we have to make sure that we manage to look at but uh, all in all though I think I can just give some general recommendations that we can have the d the, l the amount of fertilizer that you can use is something that can be determined by our fertilizer programs but during the earlier stages at planting we will definitely recommend compound high C, the same to, uh, uh, the same kind of fertilizer that is used for uh, tobacco, we can bring that same one as well for our crop okay. of chilies. It does quite well and it's uh, something that we have to make sure that we try to play with. Population wise per hectare, we're looking somewhere between 25 to 30,000 plants per hectare. So our range of fertilizer can range from around 750 to around 900 kgs per hectare when it comes to the amount that you might need. But again, something that is stipulated by your soil test results. Then uh, on the top dressing side, during the earlier stages, probably from week two, three and four, we can bring our ammonium nitrate to make sure that we top dress and we make sure that we supply our crop with nitrogen during its earlier stages when it still needs so much vegetative growth. There's still so much vegetative growth within our plant. We need to make sure that as soon as uh, when your plant starts to produce its fruits, it's at a point where the plant is quite much more stronger mm -hmm. to actually handle most of those little fruits. Mm -hmm. So we need to make sure that your plant is stronger your leaves are bigger and to just make sure that your crop is already looking very ready to actually handle the new crops that is going the new fruits that is going to have most of those little children that is it's going to have as it grows so we need to make sure that we correct that but then as we get into uh, the flowering period uh, probably starting from week six we will now have to look at um, fertilizers that enhance uh, flower, uh, flower and uh, uh, fruit production and also that improve the quality of our fruits as well. Most of the time we usually recommend alternating potassium nitrate and calcium nitrate on a two-weekly basis. 
so you can bring this one uh, this week or and then you can bring that one after uh, the second week but where possible if it's possible economically uh, on the farm for our farmers to actually come through and uh, apply alternate this on a weekly basis at one week intervals I think I would really really appreciate that I would really want that so that our crops can flower aggressively we get a lot of fruits from our plant and we manage to hit our bumper harvest now Francis you spoke of the plant population per hectare can you touch maybe on yield expected per hectare in terms of kilograms or tonnage and then can we also talk about the markets that are available for us Zimbabwean farmers okay so um, expected tonnage if we're looking at probably uh, the type is chili types that I mentioned which is demon and red thunder we'll be looking at um, a tonnage that can hover close to 18 tons over a um, six-month period of harvest mm -hmm. and um, it's something that our farmers can try to harness and make sure that they make sure that they, their crop doesn't lack on any nutrients just to make sure that our crop manages to hit that 18 ton threshold that we're talking about it's something that is very achievable that our farmers can maybe try to work with but at the end of the day it's something that can be achieved if our farmers grow their crop earlier into the season especially here in the high out then after that we can now talk about the markets at the end of the day um, the 18 ton that I talked about is for the fresh chilies but uh, some markets, especially the local markets, they demand their chilies dried. Okay. And the drying process comes through and it removes the water from our plants, isn't it? Removing the water drops the weight. Oh, okay, exactly. definitely. And our chilies, looking at them, the weight can even drop close to around 50%. So your overall tonnage can even drop when you dry your chili from the 18 ton that we talked about down to between 8 to 9. Oh, uh, tons over okay. a full hectare when our plants have lost their uh, when our fruits have lost their weight through the water that is lost so we have to make sure that we manage to control that earlier and uh, we manage to push up our yields so that we get the best possible out of it best possible yields so basically that's one thing that we have to look at but if you're going to send your crop out of the uh, out of the country most of the time it's usually it usually goes out as fresh if you send your crop out as fresh, then you definitely know that you are going to get a higher return because of the higher weight component because our chilies haven't dried as yet. So it's something that we have to try to look at and our farmers should definitely know that it's something which is very important. And as we move on to the other question that you asked about the markets, mm -hmm. market is something which is determined by the, it's something which um, our farmers have to research into before they get into farming their crop. So the first thing that they might try to look at is the issue of um, where they are going to market their crop. If they look at uh, probably local, uh, marketing them locally here in Zimbabwe, which varieties are much more uh, yes. demanded locally? In Zimbabwe, if you look at it, uh, the most popular ones, they are the African beds, I chili types. The African Baza chili types, there are no hybrids on the market. I'm pretty sure most of the people, they are just using uh, OPV seed. But still, it's got a higher demand because they are buyers who make uh, the tomato, uh, they will make their chili uh, sauces, will make um, uh, some paste as well from, 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 the, from those chilies. They need them dried as well. So it's something that uh, our farmers have to try to look into when it comes to the varietal selection. It's something that our farmers have to try to look at. But if our farmers manage to get an export market that they can send to, the export market comes through with some other demands hey, which uh, might include which definitely include your global gap certification and some other standards that are required globally for you to get the best possible crop at the end of the day uh, that can uh, be accepted uh, anywhere else in the world the global gap comes through and helps in terms of standardizing the good agronomic yes. practices that can be used worldwide uh, the way that I farm here in Zimbabwe is similar to the way they farm probably in Peru or Guatemala or probably uh, Australia yes. some of those countries we need to make sure that it's kind of standardized so that our crop is not rejected when it gets to uh, probably uh, Netherlands when they notice that we used a certain chemical that is not that is banned on their on their on their list of chemicals that are accepted by the global gap uh, board so we have to make sure that we get our farm certified as f first before we start to grow our chili so that we make sure that our crop is going to be accepted anywhere else in the world then after that um, fix up your logistic your logistical issue make sure that everything is perfect so that your crop gets to its destination country in the best quality so basically for those markets uh, the Thai beds I type the demon variety that I mentioned the red thunder they are quite good for that serenade is good for that as well thank you so much Francis that was very detailed on that note we have come to the end of this week's edition from me your host was Danae Manyore I'm also on Instagram it's a W Manyore and the crew behind the scenes have yourselves a fabulous evening thank you for watching <laughs>